Yeah. So today, um, I really want to um, entitle this talk. Um, staying balanced with the help of our friends. And we had a lot of sharing I, already that about our friends and family and how important it is. And I've been thinking a lot about um, the the value of, of people in our life. And uh, we came here yesterday to spend some time with our dear friends, Mary and Ed. We haven't been here in a few years, I think it's been. Um, so it felt like an important time to, to have some time together. And we were talking a lot about the power of friendship, um, especially as we choose friends who are virtuous and kind and, and have the qualities that we want to engender in ourselves. And of course, the Buddha talked about this a lot. Uh, he 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 said that the he didn't see one thing that was more powerful uh, than having good friends uh, to help us bring up wholesome states of mind and to maintain those wholesome states of mind. And he said he didn't see one, anything more powerful in bringing up unwholesome states of mind and ha maintaining unwholesome states of mind than having bad friends. Of course, we might not like casting it in that light, good friends and bad friends, but the Buddha didn't hesitate on that. <laughs> and he talked about, you know, the friends that are really there for you, who are really encouraging you to do good things, who are generous and kind. Uh, he even talked about friends that will give their life for you. And the kinds of friends that will help take care of you when you're when you're down, they don't turn away. When you're having a hard time, they're there for you. And and um, he said the the bad friends are the ones who praise you to your face and talk about you, you know, criticize you behind your back. And when you need help, they vanish. <laughs> and um, you know, they really are trying to um, take advantage. And you know, it's 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 an it's a, about conditioning and it's um, of course, we always want to support ourselves and everyone in developing wholesome qualities and people can change. So it's, it's not like putting people in a, you know, uh, pretty described box. You know, we have to be willing to be open to, the changes that people can make and certainly the changes that have happened to us as we practice. But it's, it's really so important to be aware of whether or not the friends that we have around us are really providing the qualities that, and, and exact, good examples of qualities that we also want to continue to develop. And then, you know, as the Buddha said, this is such a powerful influence on us. When last night, Ed was talking about how often you encounter the idea that environment is more powerful than willpower or how's that go? Environment. Stronger than your will. And a lot of times it's true. I mean, we absorb the negativity that we uh, have around us. You know, like if you're around friends who use rough language, pretty soon your rough language is filtering into your habits. And, and um, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that we just kind of absorb from who's around us. So sometimes people you know, ask questions about what they should do um, in certain situations. Like maybe we're involved with people that we really are, you know, we're changing, we're moving away from that kind of behavior. Maybe it's um, using alcohol, drugs, or, you know, like uh, not being very honest or not being very truthful. And we're moving away from that ourselves. And then it's like, what do we do with 
the people in our life who just don't fit in there anymore. And sometimes it's just a matter of turning our attention and developing new relationships. And then people kind of naturally fall out of our life when we're not interested in the same kinds of things anymore. That's sometimes how it happens. For me, there was this weird transition that I think was just unavoidable. <laughs> um, I mean, I always wanted to be good, but it was a lot of confusion. I didn't always know what um, what the right thing was to do. There are so many mixed messages that come from the world. Uh, sometimes it can look like the people who are living a very pure life are like a little too prudish and over the top. So, you know, it's like, trying things out and you know learning over over time through rough experience that it's very important to be careful about who we spend time with and about our own sila to really maintain those precepts or to even know about the five precepts if i had known about the five precepts all my life if someone had said you know use those as the guide for who you spend time with and Really, who you marry <laughs> that would have been a huge help. <laughs> you know, it would have saved a lot of pain um, and suffering. But there was this point because, you know, our conditioning is, um, you know, do good in school, get a good job, earn money, um, you know, and, and sometimes those situations also support virtuous behavior and sometimes they don't. And, um, you know, sometimes when you're in a, a corporate setting, you see that there are people who make it to the top by crushing everybody along the way, you know, up the ladder. And do we really want to be that kind of person? Um, but we might have, like I said, so many mixed messages. How do you know what to do? Fortunately, I think everybody kind of coming here to this program and listening and studying the Dhamma, you know, the five precepts are so critical to, and, 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 you know, there can be a temptation to fudge a little on some of them, you know, like, why is it bad to have some alcohol or whatever? And then, you know, many of you have heard me talk about, well, take four and a half precepts and really look at how it feels. Look at how your behavior is and and look at how the people around you are acting when they're using alcohol and and then you know some some teachers say it's okay to have alcohol if as long as you don't get drunk you know but when you really get serious about practice you really see how it deteriorates your state of mind and even even one drink even one glass of wine and and you don't have the clarity, the mental clarity. And I also, if you're tuned into energy, you really feel a difference in sort of that, that energetic feeling in your, in your being. Because, you know, most of the time people want to have a drink so that they let down their, their anxiety or their defenses, but then that, there goes your mindfulness. <laughs> so how do we learn how to have to be relaxed and free and open and authentic um, and happy without that kind of, I'd say, artificial influence. And part of it is who we're around. You know, can we be happy and relaxed and open with the people in our life? Because we can trust them and we are trustworthy. Um, Ed was mentioning last night that one of the important things is to be the kind of friend you want to have. And so we're working on that ourselves and then things change. And a minute ago, I referred to this weird shift that happened in my life and it was, you know, I'm, I'm, I was doing those things, you know, uh, developing my professional life and, you know, um, you know, trying to, um, have good relationships in my personal life, but without the foundation of the Dhamma, without the foundation of clarity around sila, around moral virtue. And and um, and 
and I was always interested in in kind of the spiritual side, you know, or the what's beyond this material realm. And um, so I would every once in a while I would go to see a psychic because I was interested in what they had to say. And um, I went to this random, you know, like just see this shop on the street and go in and and uh, this psychic said to me, you know, in two years, your life is going to change completely. Some of you have heard me tell this about this before. Sorry, but I was like, I don't know what to do with that information. <laughs> what does that mean? You know, so I didn't pay a lot of attention. Two years. Okay. About six months later, I did this kind of thing again at a different place. Walk into a psychic's um, parlor. And this one said, in about 18 months, your life is going to change completely. And I'm like, uh oh, <laughs> this is starting to. Woo. <laughs> and then it happened again uh, in about, you know, eight months later. And the timing was like right, right on. Something was coming. And I'm, at this point, I'm kind of like, what does that mean? They said, well, basically, none of the people in your life now are going to be in your, in your life. I'm like, because I'm going to kind of lose everything and everyone. Um, and they said, well, no, the people who are really close to you, like, you know, my, my children, my parents. Um, and what was interesting is in between that, somewhere in the, in between there, I started working at a company where I met Mary and this huge life change. I, I, I feel like Mary was the first one who was, really from my new life and she brought in um the kind of well goodness <laughs> that was so beautiful and crucial now this is more than 30 years ago but we met working at a company and to start to and we we immediately i think we're really drawn to each other and and we both have the feeling that this uh, this friendship has been happening through lifetimes, even though I don't have any, you know, like real specific memories of that. Um, it's it's a very strong feeling, and she's over there nodding her head, yeah, <laughs> some kind of really strong connection. And there was much more of an influence of of more uh, spiritual activities. And uh, she introduced me to the place where I eventually did the uh, ministry training. And, and when I look back, I can see how besides my family, really everyone else fell, fell out of my life, which is a huge shift. And the shift also to being completely, you know, holding the spiritual development and, um, and, and growing uh, our own character became the highest priority, which, you know, uh, from myself, that's when I really found happiness, you know, to, to really put that as the central focus and peace. Um, and then that guides everything else. So Mary um, was in, like I said, has been in my life for more than 30 years. And uh, Ed came on, came along later <laughs> a bit when Mary, Mary started to um, um, form a relationship with Ed. Then I also got to meet Ed and, and so now we're visiting here after all these years. And over the years, Mary and Ed have been so incredibly kind, generous, supportive. Um, you know, they, I mean, Mary, <laughs> I've got to know her family, of course, over that time. And um, I remember her, her mom was, or her whole family was such sweet, sweet, wonderful people. And her mom, um, Mary was the third child uh, to be born in their family. And her mom was like, and then there came Mary. 
<laughs> the angel and i have this idea of mary came straight down from the heaven realms to be here with us and and it's like um such a kind of in, it seemingly innate goodness and um beautiful beautiful qualities worth emulating and then ed i've never known anyone more generous i mean my <laughs> and when I needed a, uh, well, when it was clear that it was very helpful to give me a place to stay as a woman in robes, they invited me to stay with them, which was a, a super important support to help carry me over some rough patches in finding my way in the holy life. And whenever there was any kind of thing I needed, Ed would always produce it. <laughs> Almost like a magician with many pockets and <laughs> just get oh, oh, you need, you know, <laughs> you need a line in your room for your rope. Got it. You know, you need <laughs> and whatever, whatever. I can't even think of the all weird things <laughs> and, and happened to have on hand. <laughs> and he was like that with with everyone. So also seeing how they um, developed their friendships with people and and you know this ability to have friends that you could talk with about anything um, and then over the years you know letting go of having to have a kind of uh, alternative face in the world uh, letting go of having to have some kind of facade and being able to recognize that then the people who come into our life also don't have to put on any kind of airs or any kind of like pretense. This is very beautiful. And so when, when I think about balance, because a lot of times people say, how do you, how do you maintain balance? Especially, you know, when we were checking in with each other, it's like all the different things that happened in our lives, parents being ill and, um, dying and people, you know, like uh, losing various important stabilizing structures in our life, whether it's our career or uh, taking a turn, or in that case, my whole life taking a turn, a real shift for the better, but still um, life can throw a lot of things at us that could be very unsettling. And one of the most helpful stabilizing factors. I know there are some tissues around here somewhere. Hold on a second. <laughs> I had some in my pocket. Oh, I think that allergy thing is also. Oh, I'm okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> my dear friends are like scurrying in different directions. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so how do we keep our balance? You know, and one of one of the important factors is having our friends. You know, even even having um, your name on the chanting list. You know, it's like people are thinking of you, and there's a connection. Of course, I have no doubt uh, about the connection with what's beyond this material world that also has all those elements of support. But the people who are directly around us, who come to our aid um, when we're going through hard times, whether they're, you know, across the world uh, online, which we're very fortunate to have that, now, or they're in our physical space, you know, that kind of support, an ability to see things from a different perspective, when we might be kind of going down a rabbit hole, or when we have tough decisions to make someone to talk to and i didn't really mention so so mary came into my life like i said over 30 years ago and then ed um oh well, i don't know how much later it was maybe maybe 20, maybe 20 over 20 years ago and then i had Shitsananda showed up in my life when i was at the Kuni, of course and um one of the things about good friends is they're they're willing to sacrifice. And when we visited Ajahn Gana these past uh, few visits, and he always talks about Siesala, which is a, a kind of sacrifice. It's a Thai word for 
you know, really being willing to give what's hard to give. And I mean, I actually did not know when we, the first time when she stayed with me a few times and it was in a, in a place where she could have a bedroom and <laughs> some space. But then I moved to the little apartment in Mountain View and we were planning to have another bhikkhuni stay and Ayesha Dananda come uh, for the rains retreat for three months. And and her, you know, it's like, but we only have two two bedrooms. The bhikkhunis will be in those bedrooms. And she's like, that's okay. I can sleep in the cedar chest in the shrine room. <laughs> and we had these jokes about her getting up in the morning out of the cedar chest, kind of like a reverse vampire, you know? <laughs> And uh, yeah, <laughs> she didn't have to sleep. In the, she didn't wind up sleeping in the cedar chest, but <laughs> the willingness to, to sacrifice, to put up with things that aren't so convenient for the sake of our friends. This is really, this is really important for the sake of being with people who have um, the kind of love and generosity and virtue and wisdom and faith that we also want to develop. And then to have those relationships to support us. So, you, you know, when we think about our own life, <laughs> I remember when I turned 40, I think you were already in my life, but um, there was a 40th birthday party and there was alcohol and live music and dancing. And I used to love to dance. Um, so that was, you know, like what was happening. And after it was over, I thought, you know, none of the people who came, I don't know if you were there. Did no, you, you didn't come. No. no. See, this was the, the, the shift. <laughs> the shift was happening. Mary wasn't even there. <laughs> and, and afterwards, I like, I don't even know these people. I I don't, these people really aren't my friends. And it was so interesting. It's like, I could really recognize that I really didn't have friends. And how do you get through 40 of years of your life and you don't really have friends? And then, like I said, Mary was the first one. She kind of, and gave me so many pointers through the transition I was making. And it's it's kind of amazing when your life changes so much and to see the people who really are there through all the changes. It's really, it's really valuable. And sometimes people ask, well, how do I deal with people who are in my life and they're not gonna go away? Well, maybe those are family members <laughs> who aren't on the page I'm on, <laughs> you know, um, whether that's morally or politically or whatever. And, you know, doing what we can to be kind and see the good qualities in them and set boundaries so that we don't absorb what we don't want to absorb. But we are the way we want to be kind and generous, caring. One of the things about Mary, I think I'm going to cry here, sorry. <laughs> she never says anything bad about anybody. And it's so beautiful. So it's not like she never is encountering people who are challenging, but how you take it and what you do with it is so important. And the skill in the boundaries. Uh, last night, Ed was talking to me about different phases in his young life and how he just kind of turned away you know, from certain groups and their activities. And it wasn't like he had to make some kind of big statement or some tearing apart of previous relationships. He just stopped checking in, talking to them. Um, and they weren't calling him either. <laughs> it, just, it just naturally kind of like drifted into the 
into the past. So the Buddha, you know, when he talked about having good friends, you know, another thing that he said was the most powerful external influence is another human voice. So we want to be listening to the right voices. You know, go visit the amazing teachers who are further along on the path than we are. Um, you know, when the Buddha talked about good friends, he said he was the best friend. <laughs> and we're so lucky to have so many teachings so that we can really have a sense of him as a person and his very, you know, is a solid, consistent representation of reality. And so recognizing that this is such an important part helps some of our decisions become easier. So like um, when someone asks, you know, I've got these three job offers and I don't know which one to take. And most of the time, what are we looking for? You know, the salary, the work environment, how much autonomy we have, is there, um, you know, opportunity for growth and, and uh, development? Is there, you know, all of that. But I think the most important thing is what are this, what are the values in that environment? When we work somewhere, when we work with people, it's also a community and we're absorbing and we're um, training our mind regardless of what we're doing. So which company of those three, let's say, has the, the best uh, code of ethics and the most willing and able and shown that they that they operate according to them. And in what environment can we show up? I want to say most authentic. I'm not sure if that's clear, but where we can really be the good person that we want to be in that environment. And we don't have to feel like we have to hide something like that. We don't feel like we, we need to pick up the unwholesome practices that are there, hopefully mostly it's wholesome practices. Now I'm not talking about perfection because it isn't, it's too idealistic, but looking for the, the best of the options in this regard, it's more important than how much money we make. It's more important than how much um, prestige we have by far. You know, can I be a good person in this job? Is that going to be supported? Or am I going to be constantly kind of pulled in a direction that isn't going to make me happy in this life or the next life? So thinking in those terms, what's going to make, what's going to bring true happiness now and in years to come and in lifetimes to come? And so... That was what I wanted to share this morning. And I really appreciate all of you, good friends. So if you have anything you'd like to say, please raise your hand. Yes, Deborah. I think I see a physical hand there and I can't see everybody. Maybe I can. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Deborah. It was so nice listening to you talk right now. Oh my, it was beautiful how you talked about your friends and how wonderful it is and how you were going to the psychic and they were telling you things were going to change and, and, and you didn't understand it, but now you understand it and how you met Mary and her, and her partner and it, it it was so wonderful to hear that because it's so nice to be able to and showing your feelings too showing your feelings around them like that is it's just so beautiful 
I really, it was taken aback by that because I'm, I'm not good at that. I'm not, I'm not, I, I try to be like that. I have a hard time with that, um, with others because I'm, I'm not there yet. I'm not, it takes a long time, I guess. Um, but, but it was so beautiful to listen to that. I really appreciate that. Um, I, I just started, I just started practicing Buddhism when I went to a therapist called Dr. Scott Feldman. Um, and he, he's, when I looked at him, I seen him as a person I wanted to be like, just the way he behaved and how he was and how calm he was. And, and just the way he spoke to me, how kindly he spoke to me. And, um, and I don't, I don't have that yet with other people. I have it with here when I come here. I, I feel it so much so, and I feel it with him so much so, and um, I'm just grateful. That's all I can say, and I I think it's beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. I that was beautiful what you said because it really, it just feels it must feel so wonderful, and it's nice that you're so vulnerable enough to to share that with us and show your emotions. Thank you, I appreciate that. I do. Thank you so much. Thank you, Deborah. I love it. I do. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Anybody feeling any challenges with this? topic that you'd like to explore a little bit thank you challenges yes <laughs> <laughs> uh, I agree with Deborah this was absolutely lovely and really uplifting which served to point out even more mm, acutely what I become aware of in my own practice and in my being and that is um, uh, my friends and I surround myself with good people. And so that's not the problem. I, I seem to be the problem. And um, in that way, I discovered uh, during a meditation this last week, um, you know, we have our three defilements, right? Greed, hatred, and delusion. And am I in a certain level of conceit, wander around thinking, oh, I don't have that. I don't have those things. I know, right? Right? Uh, and until I recognized the level of, uh, you know, because I take it literally, hatred, I'm a very literal person, so I'm going, you know, I'm not throwing blood on people or I, I know, whatever. <laughs> but the aversion, and the 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 real ill will that I have uh, surrounding certain yeah, people I see on TV, certain languages that I hear during radio programs, certain uh, it it's gee many Christmas. It's like somebody just blew me up. I just love like this, and and what happens is it I verbalize it. Uh, in a very strong way um, and and I it was shocking to see that yes dear you have this defilement you do so I'm thinking well it's not what uh, it's not part of the path it's not what I want to be it's not who I want to be and so I do believe that the the way out is to just recognize it and to, you know, go into the four right efforts. Boy, the, it comes up and you stop it and you replace it. And with a lot of um, as much kindness and compassion as I can muster, uh, because <laughs> more ill will for me is not helpful. Uh, so any words of wisdom that you had to add to that, I would appreciate. Well, thank you so much for sharing that because that's a struggle we all, we all have. And 
um, actually the talk I was thinking about giving this morning would be on, was on aversion. <laughs> it's so it's so much a part of our our experience and and working through. And so my plan is to talk about it next Saturday and working with aversion because, you know, it, it's, it arises. Yeah. And, and we, what you're, what you're saying and demonstrate, first of all, when you, when you said you're the problem and I'm thinking, Oh no, I know you, <laughs> this is a person who opened her house to us on numerous occasions that we stayed with in Portland uh, when we'd come up to teach and you're a gem. Don't forget that. And we all have still the purification to do. And so we're working our way through it, you know, and having these good friends around us can help, you know, we can help, we can all, you know, help each other with this purification and help each other work with the stuff that comes up and and one of the that's why when we have friends that we really trust and we feel like we can talk with them about anything then we can talk about that and we can also you know help each other put it in a bigger context um of lifetimes perhaps as the buddha did so often uh, bringing relief to our hearts so that we feel like we can you know really allow ourselves to see that aversion in ourselves and to work with it. And, and I like what you said, you know, with kindness and compassion for ourselves with, with a willingness to actually feel those feelings instead of shove them under the rug, but not act on them. And when I read the suttas and I see the Buddha talking about these same qualities, I'm reminded that this has been the case for human beings for 2,500 years. No, nope, that was actually from the beginning of human beings, <laughs> you know, so, you know, we're in, we're, we're not, we're not, um, you know, experiencing anything that just isn't really part of the natural unfolding in a sense. I don't know if I like that way of putting it, but this is what it is. And this is what we need to do. And you're doing it. And we help each other. Um, I'm so grateful to have a companion in the holy life like Ayachitananda that we can talk about whatever's coming up for us and help each other. And you know how it is. It's like there are times when you have a companion and you're both in a bad space at the same time. That is really hard. But there's also a lot of times when only one of you goes down and the other one has, <laughs> and it helps, <laughs> helps pick you up. And of course, the going down and up gets a lot less dramatic mm -hmm. with the development on the path. Till it's it's you know it's it's not these waves anymore. <laughs> it's like this little you know kind of ripple gets to be a lot easier. But yeah, yeah I really I think, appreciate your share. You know, that was I think that's what what the the realization. It, it was shocking to me. It was really shocking because I thought, well, I don't have that. And the yeah. utter delusion, the utter, the complete delusion that I have surrounding that, I'm just saying, and, and it's not about, I'm a bad person. It was so, it's so painful. It's just painful. Yeah, that is really great. It's great because that's what helps us. Um, you know, the Buddha said that, when we see what's better, what would be better, and we don't go for it, it's because we haven't realized the danger in in being the way we are. And so this the mind has all these mechanisms that hide our our faults from us. And we rationalize and we, you know, all kinds of things. And and until we're really willing to become very honest with ourselves, honesty with ourselves. First and foremost, we can't get anywhere without that. We have to really be, sometimes I say brutally honest, which is maybe a little harsh, but it's like we do. We have to be so willing to um, let the let the real experience that we're having come to light and, and then work with it. Because that's the only way we can um, purify it. 
And you also reminded me, you know, earlier when people were checking in, there was a little talk about transportation, getting a car finally after years of not having one and flying places. And, you know, like we flew to Hawaii to see our friends. Yeah, it's not the greatest thing for the environment. But no, use the use the transportation for good things. Um, we have a friend who's very worried about climate change, and they they criticized us taking a group of people to Thailand, and we're like, wait a minute. Well, it wasn't me. It was Aya Chitananda was there for that conversation, and her response was, wait a minute. Um, this person who was saying it also had an incredible breakthrough by going to Thailand many, many, many years ago. And I said, that changed your life. You know, how can you say we shouldn't take people to Thailand? You know, but but knowing why we're doing something, you know, if we're going to use our credits, let's use them on something really transformational, something that really is going to help us and not not just a bucket list. Scrap the bucket list. When I had gone out, talking to those folks who had just come on from touring around India, and he's like, you don't need to go to India. Just come here and talk to me. <laughs> and it's was like, yeah, when we really think about it, you know, what what is it that really is beneficial? You know, um, and what do we really want to do with the time we have left? So making use of these benefits that we have of enough money, enough food, shelter, um, and enough, you know, like we can actually do things to help others and to develop ourselves is what's really important. Yeah. Thank you, Patty. Neil? Oh boy. Um, so what, what Patty brought up is kind of sending me off in a different direction. And I'm glad you're going to talk about a version next week because I kind of want to get back to what came up for me while you were talking earlier. Um, and it's so funny that I haven't thought to bring this up here, I think because it's something that really has been troubling me. But um, so while you were talking, it what came up in my mind was an incident that happened a few months ago with my upstairs neighbor, who is, he calls himself a, a hermit Catholic monk. He is somehow ordained as a monk, but he lives by himself. And he practices with the local Catholic uh, church. And then there's a Catholic monastery next door to Abayagiri that he's affiliated with. And um, he doesn't drive and I help him out a lot with things. Um, but at some point, I think over the Thanksgiving period, he had asked me to do something with him that I wasn't able and really wasn't willing to do. And I can't even remember what it was, but... He got angry with me and he said, you Buddhists, you're only interested in yourself. And we Christians are all about helping others. And I just didn't know how to respond to that. And so I just, you know, it was sort of like, oh, you know, I gave one of those looks like, oh, you know, I could never possibly explain to you how wrong you are. And I went back into my apartment and just have not stopped thinking about it. Um, and as I guess as you were talking, that popped up in my head because it seems to always be in my head since this happened. And I thought she's talking about herself and being around friends is about improving yourself, self, self, self. And what is my response to that? And for I had a glimmer of it as you were talking. Something else that you said then made me think, well, well, wait a minute. And I've sort of always believed, I've believed this for a long time, that you really can't 
help other people until you make yourself a better person. And I, I mean, I had it expressed in my head while you were talking much better than I'm ever going to be able to express it now. But um, I did. <laughs> and so I hadn't really realized how much this has been gnawing at me since this incident happened. Um, and I don't know that I really have a question and it, it could be a question that's really for a whole other topic. But um, I mean, I think, you know, it got me thinking about the monks at Abayagiri and it's like, what are they doing for the world? You know, are they doing anything for the world by living that way? Um, I know there's an answer and I don't, I guess I'll just leave it at that because I feel like it is going off topic, but. Um, oh, I'm not sure if it's off topic. I have, you don't have a question, but I have some answers. <laughs> <laughs> they're really not mine. They're, they're the Buddhas. Um, you know, he talked about Buddhism is, is, in some ways distinct from other religions as it's non-theistic and it's self-reliant. So um, the Buddha said that we have the responsibility for our own, we have to work out our own awakening. We, no one can do it for us. Even though I'm talking about how important friends are and how important that external environment is, we are still responsible for ourselves. And even as a teacher, one of the things Ajahn Ganha said to Aya Chitananda and to me when we visited him the very first time, and Ed and Mary were there, they came with us to Thailand. We were talking about that trip. They did the Arahant tour before there was an Arahant tour with us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, um, and one of the things Ajahn Ganha said was that Ayachitananda is responsible for her own training. So as me, I think, okay, I'm the teacher. I have to be responsible. And I'm responsible for my part. I have to remember that. And it's not like we don't have an influence on each other. We have an incredible influence on each other. But at the end of the day, we have to take care of our own minds. We have to train our own minds. We have the responsibility ourselves and no higher power is going to save us that's the buddhist story and i believe it we have to do it and he also says I'm trying to think which sutta it is it's a great sutta in the Ma majima nikaya um i think it might be the number eight on effacement there's a section where he says if someone is sinking into the quicksand and you're also in the quicksand, you cannot pull them out. You have to get up on solid ground first and then you can pull them out. So we can help each other and we do help each other. And even meditation, the calm, the development of the mind spreads it spreads to the people you come in contact with and it spreads beyond that. Talk about this beyond the material world thing. And the, the very first place I lived as a nun, it was in this neighborhood of townhouses. And someone one day said to me, we're so glad that you nuns are here because it helps the whole neighborhood. And it's not like we're proselytizing. We're not allowed to do that. <laughs> but there's something there. You know, You, I mean, for many of us, you see a monk walking through town or a nun, and it's inspiring, it reminds us of something. You know, I mean, the Buddha took responsibility for his own enlightenment before he helped others, and he's still helping us. So teaching, helping people make good decisions. Um, I mean, a Bayagiri, it's a teaching order. And this, this, this argument about who's more selfless, this is age old. You know, the, this is the 
false dichotomy, I would say, between the Mahayana and the Theravada. You know, Mahayana, Bodhisattva vow, you're vow vowing to help everyone else get enlightened before you do. And the Theravada is like, work out training your mind and wake up. And what I came to realize is it's two sides of the very same coin. It meets in the same place because you can't develop yourself without helping other people. First of all, the people that I've known that I feel like I believe are awake are, are arahants. They're constantly helping other people in, in beautiful ways. And there's no self there anymore. So talking about the self developing is the conventional reference to self. The Buddha also identified this two different ways of talking about but there's no self, not on the, not on the, the what do I want to say, um, level, uh, unconventional level, the spiritual level. There's no self. Everybody knows that. I mean, we hear the Buddha telling us at least, <laughs> you know, so it's not about. I'm going to develop the ego. The ego just starts to disintegrate. What you're developing are these good qualities. You're developing skill. You're developing selflessness. And you want to, you want to give what's hard to give because there's nothing worth holding on to. And there's, there's no way that you're going to, be dedicated to the development of everyone else and not develop yourself. How is that possible? With that kind of generosity and kindness, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna develop. If you're doing it the right way, if you're really doing it selflessly, this, this chitta here is going to develop. And, and, and I think vice versa, the more you, develop yourself the more it maybe not in the tangible ways of like you know going and feeding the homeless every day or whatever but it in my like I feel like in my own um world my own place in the world I know like I've become more genuinely compassionate to my own family in ways that I wasn't before um to my friends um, in my community. Um, and maybe that's the most I can do. Um, but I don't know how you explain that to somebody who comes up to you and says, you know, why aren't you doing this and doing that and helping this and helping that? Um, you know, how do you explain that? Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I I I know I I feel it in my heart but when people are coming at you from their own very intense selves their own intense egos I mean we had a discussion when you know after my um brother-in-law's funeral and some cousins came over to my sister's house and and we were all there and somehow the talk came to uh, to God and I'm just sitting there very quietly and trying not to say anything. But then eventually, you know, it came up, you know. You just have to kind of be quiet. And because I don't know how to explain the difference of, you know, what I believe and what m most of the people in my world believe. Um, I don't know. I'm rambling now. But yes, thank you. Oh, what you're pointing at is really a, a real very fruitful, very important investigation. And when you go deeper into it, the deeper you go into it, the less of an argument there is, the less disparity there is. And it's, and that's a, that's an investigation for each of us to do. It's like, it's like the Dhamma, you know, it has to be realized individually by the wise. So it's like, this is a very important area 
investigation. And like you said, when, when whoever it is on whatever side of whatever argument, when the self is really like um, rising up and angry, defensive, blaming, dualistic, you know, we got to have compassion. And recognize, well, that's the wrong path. <laughs> you know, we don't. We want to try to be understanding because that comes up in ourselves and it comes up in others and be understanding and recognize that that's not the voice we want to listen to. We know where that voice is coming from. You know, how much of proclaiming our religion, our philosophy is really a way of saying, my group is better, I am better than you. You know, that that de defiled human tendency to want to set ourselves above others. And then I'm also reading this book, on How to Be an Anti-Racist. Talk about peeling away the layers of what we've been taught no matter what our race is or how we've been racialized. I mean, this book is great. It's written by a, a, a black man who's a professor who's amazing and intelligent and, and, and ha has gone through his own trials of being conditioned to be racist and how to unpack all that and understand it and all of the mechanisms that we've become used to that we think are just, we're, we're not even aware of to keep those, those distinctions in place. And you know what? The Buddha was an anti-racist. There wasn't even racism when he was alive, but he was anti-categorizing people according to these characteristics that are meaningless. But that does, and, and at the same time, we have to take race seriously because of the incredible damage that it, that racialization does and the reality of that in our societies. So it's like all of these things, this is, this is what we're unpacking. All of this, I'm better, I'm worse, I'm equal. That the Buddha said, if we're doing, if we're coming from that place, we're on the wrong track. We go beyond all that. Not beyond it in a like, oh, uh, spiritual bypassing way. We got to go through it. Really, really soften the heart. Really, really open the heart wide. To be an anti-racist means that you don't. But I want to, the, the definitions of the book are really clear. Where you, you recognize when things, when there are racist ideas and racist policies and racist behaviors and you stand up against that so that you know people are valued for where they are and what their characteristics are and what their socialization is and that, and you support every different circumstance in that regard. Yeah. So there's a lot here to learn and and to I think you're wise not to say anything until you really have that come from that place of kindness and compassion and wisdom to understand it. And you can say things. We had a situation, I know we're getting close and I want to hear from these last three people, but we had a situation at a Buddhist Western Buddhist monastic gathering. So it's all monastics, Buddhist monastics from different groups. And we had this, this um, dichotomy of the Northern school and the Southern school come out. And someone I have tremendous respect for from the Northern school was, was repeating this kind of negativity about the Arahant path. And then, you know, because of his association with Theravadan monastics, over the, the next few years, he really changed. He really investigated this whole concept. And, you know, you could see the coming together of those perspectives. It's really, it's possible, quite beautiful. 
So thank you, Neil. We'll talk about a version next time. <laughs> Linda? Uh, in certain respects, I think you, you've, uh, Neil, and you covered a little bit of what I had on my mind, but when you were talking about spiritual friends and you know who we surround ourselves with, I can say uh, with with certainty that I don't have people anyone in my life that I would say is a real negative influence. But in um, in the community I live in, I don't know of any other Buddhist practitioners. Um, you know, I'm like 25 miles from Bellingham and I have dear, dear Dharma friends there, but we're not down the street and we don't meet for tea, you know, regularly or anything like that. And the people that I have in my life in this community are really good people. Um, they, um, they're, they're kind and generous and we help each other. Um, and we've all been having a lot of illness among our group and people are just rallying and supporting us in, in lovely ways. Um, and, and in this group, the, the, none of these people have any sort of religion, with the exception of me. Um, and so um I feel that lacking and, and um, I feel that I there's a certain aspect of communication that I'm unable to have with them. And I and I and I I miss that. And, you know, my Greg and I talk a lot about trying to move to Bellingham and, you know, we keep working on it. But so far, it's not coming together. Um, but. But yet it's, it seems like these people still um, in my community are Im important friendships and I'm able to definitely practice precepts with them. And uh, I would say they they unknowingly practice four and a half precepts. <laughs> I mean, they're they're good people. So, I you know, I'm just not quite sure. I mean, it doesn't seem to me that there's any reason not to maintain these friendships. Oh, I would completely agree. You see the good qualities in them. This isn't about being Buddhist or, you know, like, yeah, maybe you can't talk about not self in a, the same way you would with us, or you can't talk about, you know, past lives or future lives or, you know, like a whatever, I don't know, but that that's not what's important. I mean, to to live in a community where people have sila and dana, you know, like the moral virtue and kindness and compassion and supporting each other in material ways. And, and it is in spiritual ways, whether they have a religion or not, isn't what's important, I would say. How much right view do they have, you know? And then you don't have to, You, I mean, I think it's wise to recognize where you know, that half precept is, is, is not, you know, the greatest and all that, but I'm not, you know, I don't think it's about, it's not about surrounding ourselves with perfect people. I mean, there is a, a sutta in the Yagutra Nikaya where the Buddha says, you know, really surround yourself with people who are better than you are. <laughs> because You're going to get better than, you know, but it's like, that's not that this world isn't ideal. I mean, I think all of the qualities you're mentioning about your friends, put your focus on that. And you don't have to, like you said, they're not really a negative influence in your life. So you don't have to like throw them away. And you don't really have to move if you feel you've got enough spiritual communication and connection with people you know, going into Bellingham sometimes for programs and going on retreats and coming online. Now that we've got the online stuff, it's like we have we have that available. Um, so, yeah, this this talk is certainly not intended to discourage maintenance of friendships that are virtuous in ways that are valuable and important. But yeah, it's it's not about perfection in that sense. So you just have to 
I think the main thing is to be aware of, like you said, that is it a negative influence? It doesn't sound like it. Is there something that's you're missing that you really feel is important to have? Maybe, maybe you will move to Bellingham at some point. I don't know. Or maybe you can find that you know, like in these other ways. But this is not intended to say, you know, like you have to turn away from people who have different religions or different views from us. Um, sometimes having those differences helps us to go deeper too in our own reflection. And like, you know, what Neil's talking about, if he didn't have his Christian monk upstairs, you know, maybe this, this exploration wouldn't be happening. It's okay. We have to know how strong we are in ourselves to, you know, if we're strong enough to maintain our, our own um, stability. So it's about, you know, we, we, we have, balance with the help of our friends if we can maintain our balance and if if you have people like like um, the community i grew up in people were incredibly supportive of each other did good things for each other all the time i don't agree with some of the religious views but i'd rather live with those people than you know people who want to have wars for example and those people too, we're not gonna like just discount. They've got good qualities. We wanna put the focus on good qualities and look at the impact on our lives and make decisions from there. I hope that's clear. Yeah. And thank you for bringing this up. Thank you. Caridwin? Thank you, Anaya. Um, I have to say, I'm really nervous about talking about this and I almost took my hand down, um, 10 times over because, um, I, I, um, I'll just say like, I struggle a lot with, um, what to do when hatred is turned towards you. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, I feel like I am often surrounded by it. Like I come here for sanity, you know, like people who are kind and um, there isn't a lot of that. Um, and there wasn't a lot of it when I was growing up, you know, um, just like the, you know, the death of next Benedict in Oklahoma. I mean, I came out in Oklahoma. Um, this was the young genderqueer person um, who was killed recently. And um <clears throat> Uh, was bullied before that and no, nothing was done by the school. There wasn't, you know, uh, disciplinary action or anything, but, but that's the environment that I grew up in, you know, where there was a lot of hatred. Um, and, um, uh, you know, um, coming out as queer or being mixed race, like, you know, being the child of an immigrant, um, and, uh, you know, and, I still have an apartment um, that I don't go to very often because I feel like it's a vortex of hatred. Like I was just there the other day because they're going to do an inspection and my apartment is not inspection ready. And I was just sitting in my van waiting for my caregiver to come get me. And this woman got out of a car and looked into the van right into my eyes with this look of utter hatred. And I, I just like, it, it hurts, you know, it's like, it hurts when there's all this hatred and, um, anger and, um, <clears throat> there, I don't know why it was like, I've had hatred turned toward me because, um, you know, because I live in a van or because, um, you know, I have, uh, requested ADA accommodations at the building and the landlords are hostile and a lot of their friends live there. So I just, you know, it's like, I don't know what to do with it. And I've talked about this before, but like, I feel it from retreat centers too. Like it's, it's more um, like discriminatory practices, practice at retreat centers um, towards people who don't have as much money, um, are disabled, 
you know, like we're kept out, you know? Um, and, uh, I mentioned to one of the retreat centers, you know, I go to this other place and they com they're completely Donna based and the, the diversity there is wonderful. It's so, there's so many like, you know, people of different races and, um, so many queer people. And, you know, I, I just urge you to consider going to a Donna base because, um, you know, you're going to get a lot more people of different, you know, a variety of people and, um, yeah, that's not going to happen. So, um, anyway, I just like, I wanted to, I, I sort of feel like the reason I didn't want to raise my hand and why, why I wanted to take my hand down is sometimes I feel like, um, there's more people saying, I don't know. I don't know. I feel like I'm, I rain on the parade sometimes. Cause it's like, you know, <laughs> but it's, it's just like, I, and, and I honestly, I didn't feel hatred or anger towards this woman. It was just like a little bit of like bewilderment. Like, what did I do to you? Like, I've never had an interaction with you in my life. You know, I don't know who this person is. And um, yeah, so, I mean, I guess that's good. You know, that's good. That shows that, you know, I, something has happened that I didn't direct hate back at her, you know, um, but it, it felt really hurtful. And, um, and I feel that sometimes with, with the retreat centers, like, even though they, they, they sound nice, like they somewhat nice sometimes, sometimes they're not very nice about things. And, um, ultimately like I, can't go on a lot of retreats because of those discriminatory practices. So, and, you know, it just, I remember one Buddhist teacher, a lay teacher who said to me one time, cause I had called her asking what, what should I do with this? Like, I thought they would be better than this. And she said, just remember they're all people too. Like you're putting them on a pedestal and expecting something better. And they still imbibe this discriminatory stuff in the environment too you know so yeah. anyway I just wanted to say that thank you well I appreciate your generosity and courage because we all need to take this in and and remember I mean that that um that tension is within us and that tension is around us of wanting to do be good and do good things and having defilements arise. And so we all are working with this if we're committed enough and conscious enough to do it and courageous enough to do it. And, you know, offline, I'd like you to talk to, to us about the situations you're experiencing because there's so much that that we as human beings are conditioned into that we don't even realize we need to make conscious and we need to make clear. And, you know, like retreats, Buddhist retreat centers, they're trying to do something really good and they are doing things that are really good. And they have the dilemma of they have to keep the place afloat. So even like Spirit Rock, they do one Donna based retreat, as far as I know, our monastic retreat is, the, is Donna based, but they only do one a year and that's a huge operation with you a lot of money flowing in so you know it's like what's their economic reality and then how can they how can they do more um within the you know means of what's practical to and a lot of it is the lack of awareness that we have like i i know i'm i've had 70 years of being unaware of so many kind of conditioned in attitudes and perceptions that are wrong about all these distinctions among us that we take as something, some reason to put ourselves above or below or equal to. And that we, and that we support with, because we don't stand up for, we support policies that cause suffering to people and it is painful it's painful when people look at us with disdain 
because of some perception that they have and they don't know us. I was when I'm in one of the poems we looked at on Tuesday night in this, this monk who's, who said, people make fun of my physical appearance, but they don't know me. They don't know what's inside. They don't even know what's outside. And then some people are really uh, so um, adoring of my voice. They love my voice. They become carried away by the voice. They don't know what's inside and they don't know what's outside. And even if they know what's outside, they still don't know me. And it is painful. We take it personally, but it's not personal. When we have aversion, when we have disdain, when we have hatred, when we disregard others, it's our problem. And when we're on the, the receiving end of that, we need to remember to not take it in. And to, and to re remember, I don't mean we're not like superhuman. We can be just compassionate all the time, but we need to try to come around to that perception and you know I always have this hope for you that you're gonna if sooner I hope than later um, have a place to live that's on the edge of a Buddhist community where you can be autonomous and happy and supported and really giving to the community and receiving from the community because that would be so great so I just um I know it's like I've kept you like 16 minutes over time and never do this, but I so much appreciate um, your sharing. Thank you. Joyce, you have something you want to say here at the end. Okay, this is in response to um, Herdwin's wish and East Bay Meditation Center in Oakland is exactly the kind of organization that she's describing with. Yeah, I think she knows about this already, Joyce. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. I think we'll go and um, yeah, everybody take care. Um, I hope you have a great week. And thank you, Ed and Mary, for hosting us here today and letting us do this. And um, yeah, be well. Sadhu. Would anybody like their sharing to be omitted from the recording? This is always a total welcome option. If anybody would rather not have this out into the world, let us know now.